uh, Tofino, you're still muted, I think. No, I'm here. So, uh, okay. I'm welcome just back. speaking. <laughs> I couldn't hear you. <laughs> welcome back, everybody. Uh, yes, we have two more presentations up uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's been very interesting, the whole thing. Um, we hope to be able to share uh, this with you afterwards, uh, but uh, we'll let you know uh, later on about that. So we have uh, actually two offices of, of, of EFTA. Uh, Marius Andersen, who is the deputy head of the EFTA statistical office in Luxembourg. He will speak about the role of NSIs in a new EA data framework. But first up here is uh, a colleague here in, in Brussels, uh, Tron Helke Bartsen. He is officer in the Internal Market Division, and he will speak about a single market for data in the EEA. So, Trond, here you are. Thank you very much, uh, Thulvinur, uh, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. I will just try and share my screen. I also had a bit of issue with this actually earlier, but uh, let's see. Um, See. There you are. Yes, I can see. There we are. All right. Yes, very good. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Yes, it's been a long day, but it's been a very, very interesting day. Uh, I think it was uh, Gunnar Jakobsen who said earlier that he had his screen full of uh, note its and um, for me as well of course I have to try and be digital but I've certainly taken a lot of notes uh, during the day as well it's been really interesting to hear so many perspectives and takes on of course uh, very much um, the same the same topic so Yes, my name is Tuan Helge Bartsen and I'm an officer in the uh, internal market division here at the EFTA Secretariat in Brussels. And uh, my main responsibility is to uh, assist the EEA EFTA states uh, with incorporating uh, what we call, of course, EEA relevant uh, legislation in the area of digital. Um, and that covers everything from cybersecurity, data, uh, initiatives, data protection, of course, uh, telecoms, audiovisual services and, and e-commerce. So it's quite a broad uh, portfolio. And, and uh, I think I'd like to start off, of course, I know that we are here with an audience that is a bit above uh, average interested in statistics. Um, and we are all the time being overwhelmed with new statistics showing the rapid increase in data volumes uh, in the world. Uh, the sheer amount that our economy and society uh, and we as citizens and consumers produce every minute of the day. And it's interesting because it's uh, only a few years back that we uh, predicted that the global data volume uh, would grow to 175 setabytes in 2025. And these are, of course, familiar statistics to many of you from, from Statista. Um, and just to remind ourselves that one setabyte is approximate, approximately equal to a thousand exabytes, a billion terabytes or a trillion gigabytes. So once we get down to the kind of bytes level here, we are looking at a number when we talk about setabytes, uh, a figure with 21 zeros uh, behind it or 10 to the power of, of 21. And of course, according to the latest statistic, uh, statistics from Statista, we are now looking to reach 2,142 uh, setabytes in 2035. That's the total kind of aggregate data volume being created in the world. It represents, right, an increase of about 4,500% from, from 2020. And of course, it's an important consideration and it's been mentioned in different contexts throughout the day that uh, that a substantial portion of this data, uh, of course, is generated uh, by private companies. Uh, it's very much locked into private silos, uh, if you want to, uh, that is being owned and monetized by large uh, tech companies. And this is, of course, is very much a concern as well to policymakers here in Brussels. Uh, and elsewhere as well. Um, 
and I will return a bit to these aspects uh, of importance of data also uh, for competition uh, in the digital economy towards the end of my presentation. If we look at the kind of policy framework here, the EU of course has pre presented a long range uh, of digital strategies, uh, increasingly reflecting the growing importance uh, of data uh, over the last decades. If we look at the digital agenda, for instance, it goes back to 2010, uh, or in particular the midterm review of the digital agenda that came in 20. 12, I think it's fair to say that the data uh, was still uh, very much treated as a subset uh, to public sector uh, innovation. Then with the digital single market strategy uh, in 2015 and the communication on building the European data economy that we got in 2017, we see the importance of data for jobs, of grow, uh, jobs and growth uh, and Europe's competitiveness. Uh, it becomes more and more prevalent and becomes kind of the new headlines. Um, and of course, this, this gradual uh, change uh, with regard to the strategies from the EU side is reflected in the concrete uh, policies, uh, the concrete uh, legislative initiatives that the EU has, has presented. Um, of course, these are all initiatives that uh, are either incorporated into the EA agreement uh, or where we are in process of incorporating uh, the legislation. Uh, of course, to make sure that we create this level playing field uh, for data uh, in the entire uh, European economic area. Some of the milestones uh, in this journey, if you want, which you've heard a lot of talk about today, actually, from kind of a, a reuse uh, regime towards this single market for data is, of course, first and foremost, the public uh, sector information uh, directive, the first one from 2003. Um, and of course, this was the directive that really started to address uh, differences in reuse rules uh, between the member states and setting some minimum requirements uh, for processing data requests. It had provisions on charging systems, searchability, etc. Um, and of course, all the time when the EU presented these initiatives, it allowed the member states uh, to go much further. It set the kind of minimum standards, but it was of course up to the member states if they wanted to introduce policies facilitating larger and more extensive reuse of public data. Then with the revision of the PSI and with the Open Data Directive, we got a significant increase uh, in impact, uh, a more comprehensive sharing of public data. Of course, we got an extension of the scope. Um, we got uh, kind of marginal uh, pricing uh, as the rule with narrower exception to this. Uh, and we also got uh, new provisions to stimulate the availability and making available dynamic data uh, and APIs. And as has been said before, under this uh, open data directive, of course, we are still now waiting uh, for this very important implementing act on high value data sets, uh, which I will come back to. I just think it's important to kind of see the whole picture a bit that in addition to these legislative acts, which I mentioned here, uh, there are a range of other EU instruments with direct bear bearing on building the European data uh, economy. Uh, the general data protection regulation, of course, uh, is an important instrument. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the uh, potential remains untapped here uh, when it comes to the mechanisms that are in the GDPR also to facilitate the portability uh, of personal data. And then we have the complementing regulation on the free flow uh, of non-personal uh, data, uh, which does away with national requirements to store public records uh, um, within national borders. And we also have relevant sector uh, specific instruments uh, such as regulations on the access to vehicle data and we are waiting for a new initiative on short-term rentals um, which the European Commission is expected to present uh, in June uh, next year and of course here we have also followed um, the uh, strong push from from cities from municipalities uh, that want platforms to share data uh, about the owners and the locations of the premises they rent out about rental periods uh, and the number of visitors per night, uh, etc. But I think I'd like to say that the free flow of data regulation uh, 
which was quite innovative in one way, because it was in one way a regulation to deregulate, right? Uh, it's basically about removing obstacles or bans that exists in national law today uh, that restricts the storage and processing of non-personal data to the national uh, territory. Um, in addition to that, it aims to facilitate the flow of data between IT systems in, in Europe. And in many ways, this regulation, it could be argued perhaps, um, uh, brings us to the doorstep of this uh, single market for data. Um, it also illustrates in one way the shift, which we have heard a lot of presenters talking about today, uh, from this uh, role of the public sector as the provider, right, for, for collecting and ensuring data quality, releasing data regulatory, re regularly, etc., to the focus on building an open uh, data culture. Uh, and then identifying and empowering catalysts within these systems uh, and convening stakeholders to build this data uh, economy. Also, this renewed focus on investing in people's skills, in tools, uh, portability mechanisms uh, and data infrastructure. Um, and of course, the whole backdrop here uh, is the realization of how important data has become for the future competitiveness of Europe. Uh, and for what often now is described as Europe's digital sovereignty. Um, this has come with a renewed awareness, uh, if you want, uh, uh, about the lack of European data processing and storage solutions and how European companies are to a large extent missing uh, among the world's largest cloud service providers, for instance, or among the world's biggest online platforms. Uh, only yesterday, the European Commission uh, launched uh, its new own cloud alliance uh, in parallel to uh, what many of you are familiar with, with the, the GAIA-X alliance. And here the Commission wants to bring industry on board to develop, well, independent, right, uh, cloud service providers, but also energy efficient and highly secure cloud solutions uh, in Europe. And the essential dynamic at play in the data economy can of course be summarized as the interplay between data, between algorithms and computing power. Uh, and I think it's an important point that the EU wants to uh, up its game uh, on all these three uh, arena. And this is quite an important aspect also for the EA EFTA states and for the development uh, of the EEA framework. Uh, because it means that we have to work closely uh, with the EU uh, in implementing the relevant regulation uh, in this area. Um, but it also means that we have to cooperate closely uh, with European partners when it comes to research and development uh, of technology and data infrastructure. Uh, for instance, under Horizon Europe and the Digital Euro programme. In the Digital Euro programme, all three EFTA states, uh, EA EFTA states participate. And the European High Performance Computing Joint Undertaking, for instance, just to mention uh, an example, will play an important role in developing the next generation uh, of super supercomputers uh, during this decade. Um, so these ever increasing data sets uh, collecting from ever collected from ever increasing sources driven by the IoT revolution, um, the digitization of our lives and economy, gives ever better opportunities to train algorithms and to extract new insights from the data sets. And this again drives the demand for ever more computing power. So advances in mathematical science and computing power feeds off the world of data and creates this virtuous cycle. Then of course, having that as the backdrop, I think it's very important that when the EU presented uh, the uh, European strategy for data, they did so. Uh, at the same time as they presented their new uh, strategy for artificial intelligence. Uh, in particular, especially in order to recognize uh, that data and making data available for businesses, researchers and the public sector uh, is the most important fuel uh, also for AI. And these two twin strategies, uh, if you want to, uh, are based, of course, on the EU's fundamental view that digital technology and the digital transformation should ultimately work to make people's lives uh, better and create new opportunities for businesses, uh, uh, jobs and growth. 
Um, and the data economy should not be developed uh, with a view to maximize uh, private profit or increase social control. Uh, as Vice President uh, Vestager said when introducing these strategies, of course, then giving a nod to the slightly different models being chosen uh, in the US uh, and China. So in Europe, data should serve as a human purpose, it should serve a human purpose and help solve uh, societal challenges, uh, including, of course, helping to achieve uh, the targets, the very ambitious targets for a climate neutral Europe by 2015. It was mentioned uh, in the beginning today by, by Hege that, that we submitted an EAF to comment on the European strategy for data uh, and AI in June last year. And of course, some of the main things we emphasized here uh, was that we very much support this vision of Europe becoming a role model uh, for a society empowered by data. We also emphasized the importance of finding a common approach uh, in order to safeguard privacy and security. And then we raised um, a bit to the forefront that uh, there are very many now, there are very many um, data spaces being established uh, in, in the near future. And of course, we highlighted that there might be a need to prioritize a bit, uh, and especially focuses on the health, mobility, uh, Green Deal uh, data spaces uh, at the outset. We also lifted that the free flow of data principles which are, should, should, should be preserved uh, and that there shouldn't be too much focus on this project uh, to establish large cloud uh, federations in Europe. And then we had some issues that are very often uh, of particular interest concern perhaps also to the EAF the states, uh, uh, namely uh, on how to address uh, third country legislation on access uh, to data. Um, already today we have had uh, presentations, uh, of course, from Eurostats in particular of, of, of the European strategy for, for data. So I will not go into uh, so much detail here. Uh, the overall vision, of course, is to create a single European data space uh, where uh, personal and non-personal data can flow uh, more or less freely within this common regulatory framework. And then, of course, we are thinking about the GDPR, we are thinking about consumer protection regulation. Uh, we are thinking about cybersecurity regulation uh, with the NIS 1 directive and the revised NIS 2 directive, which we are waiting for. Um, so that's the backdrop. And then, of course, uh, we have these very important legislative initiatives that are now in the pipeline and that we are also making uh, our assessments of uh, from the EEA EFTA states uh, side. First up, of course, we are waiting, or well, it might not be first up, uh, we, we thought so for a long time, right, that this would come much uh, earlier, but now we are looking at spring uh, next year, this list uh, of high value data sets, the implementing act over under the open data uh, directive. Mm, and of course, here, uh, the main thing is to make uh, more uh, public data uh, within sectors that are very important for our economies and society, uh, available free of charge and in machine readable format or as bulk download. That's kind of the main essence within these six uh, thematic uh, categories. Uh, and here again, it's important to remember that um, experts from the uh, EAF the states uh, are of course uh, participating in the uh, PSI expert groups. They are participating in the relevant comitology committee uh, where these acts are being uh, prepared and where we also have a possibility uh, to influence uh, the outcome. Then it's of course the Data uh, Governance Act. Uh, and I think I'd like to emphasize, because we've also heard this being presented uh, today, that the Data Governance Act, uh, from the EU's perspective, I think is very much about trying to create in Europe uh, an alternative model also uh, for data sharing. Uh, to establish exactly these intermediaries uh, that can also challenge these data silos that I talked to uh, in the big talked about in the beginning, data being very much locked into uh, the great uh, online platform uh, ecosystems. Um, of course, it addresses data that is not already uh, should already ma be made available for sharing under the Open Data Directive, uh, namely commercial statistical. Uh, confidentiality protected data, uh, IP protected data and personal data. Um, 
and uh, it establishes this European single access point uh, uh, with a searchable uh, electronic register. This has of course been a bit modified in the version that we now see has been agreed uh, between Parliament uh, and Council on the 30th of uh, November. Um, this register will be available via national uh, single uh, information points. And then the Data Governance Act, of course, is very much about uh, making sure that this public sector bodies um, are probably uh, equipped, basically, to share uh, this type of sensitive uh, data. Um, and I think it's been mentioned, and I'm sure my colleague also from Luxembourg will touch upon this more uh, in detail in the next uh, slide. But of course, in addition to creating this single point of contact, um, uh, the regulation also in particular Article 7 mentioned that the public sector body should be supported uh, by a competent body uh, that can provide technical uh, and legal uh, support. Um, and of course, facilitate uh, data sharing under the Data Governance uh, Act, uh, um, be it uh, on how to anonymize data or provide pseudo-anonymized data uh, or create uh, safe uh, processing uh, environments. So again, talking about the opportunities for the uh, for the uh, national statistical institutes, of course, this is really to the core. Uh, I think of of what we have been discussing uh, today, and where there are uh, huge new interesting roles uh, to be taken on. Uh, I mentioned this overall vision of of creating. Uh, new intermediaries uh, and the way these are being set up of course uh, and the kind of independence and division that they have to have uh, between their uh, uh, own uh, functions uh, and these functions of, 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 of providing data is of course something that is very relevant uh, again to this to this uh, um, audience um, and it's interesting to notice the changes we have seen from the Commission's original proposal to what we now see uh, that uh, Council and Parliament uh, uh, agree on, right? We see some changes here. Uh, uh, in addition, that you can be able to use the branding of a data, intermedi data intermediation service provider or data altruism organizations. We now also have this uh, logo. Uh, that will make it easier uh, to identify these providers uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and interestingly also, we see that the Data uh, Innovation Board uh, perhaps will have an upgraded role uh, in, this, uh, in this regulation. Uh, um, it will of course assist the Commission in ensuring consistent practices for processing of data requests, uh, uh, but it will also uh, now uh, issue guidelines on how uh, to facilitate uh, European data spaces. And this is something we are from the EAF side again, looking carefully uh, into, of course, uh, um, with regard to, to representation and, and, and the modes of how our um, institutions should then be represented also in this data uh, innovation board. Um, the European uh, Data Act, as has been said, we don't know uh, exactly uh, what this will contain at the detail level. Um, but it's important, of course, to be aware that the uh, that the um, uh, that the public hearing uh, on the impact, the inception impact uh, assessment uh, has been published, the summary report. And we do, of course, um, expect to see these new provisions to facilitate business to government uh, data sharing. There's a broad agreement uh, that more uh, is needed in this area among all uh, the stakeholders who have replied or a huge majority of the stakeholders who have replied uh, to the Commission's consultation. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to data related to addressing emergencies and crisis management, of course, this is lifted perhaps to the very top uh, of the list of priorities. Um, when it comes to this facilitation of business to business data sharing, of course, we are still a bit uh, uh, in the dark. Uh, um, but this can very much, of course, be also building on existing uh, voluntary uh, mechanisms, uh, improving tools for data sharing, uh, 
uh, working with uh, contracts, model contract terms possibly, uh, and uh, improving the portability of, of, of cloud services. Um, I would like to finish off or try to conclude by talking a bit about these common European data spaces uh, as well, because uh, when the European data strategy was presented in February 2020, um, we saw that there were going to be introduced these nine different sectoral uh, data spaces for health, manufacturing, agriculture, finance, mobility, green deal, energy, public administration and skills. And perhaps for some time we waited for the Data Governance Act to contain more concrete uh, provisions uh, on how these data spaces would be governed. Um, what we have seen is, of course, a more kind of sectoral uh, approach, and, and we see that uh, the Commission will introduce sector-specific le legislation. The first up here is, of course, on the uh, health data space, uh, which we expect to be presented uh, by the end of February, uh, together with the Data Governance uh, Act, uh, if this time schedule holds. But I think it's important to emphasize that these are very much driven uh, by the stakeholders uh, as we see it uh, through their separate uh, expert groups, uh, through their uh, committees and networks. And there again, of course, is an important uh, priority from our side to follow closely these discussions and make sure that our experts are also represented in these uh, relevant forums, uh, such as the um, such as the health network uh, that is e-health network that is working on in being involved also with the uh, health data space. And very importantly, again, we see that under the, um, the Digital Europe program, we do expect now to see a lot of calls going into 2022 for preparatory actions to set up data spaces in the manufacturing sphere, uh, in the finance sphere, mobility sphere, etc. Uh, and again, of course, as I said, to start with, uh, the way the EAF the states also cooperate closely uh, on the program sites and also when it comes to building uh, physical infrastructure uh, and, 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 and data uh, mechanisms, work on standardization, etc. That's also a very, very important component uh, of this. My final slide is on the uh, Digital Services Act package uh, because these also has some quite important overlaps with what we are talking about uh, today, and it has been mentioned at some point, but perhaps not been at the top, of course, of of of, um, of the list of legislation which we have which we have seen presented. The Digital Services Act uh, main thing, of course, is to upgrade the liability uh, rules, the content moderation, safety rules for online platforms, but it also has important provisions. Uh, on the access to data for the very large online platforms, uh, especially and in particular to be able to scrutinize how they work and how online risks uh, evolve. Uh, there's been a lot of focus, of course, on, on hate speech, uh, on the viral spreading of, of terrorist content, disinformation, uh, etc. Uh, and here, of course, it's it's um, it's 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 fundamental and a very important concern that more data is made available to researchers, to journalists, etc., uh, to 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 create more transparency uh, and and to learn how these this type of content uh, is, is is spread and what they do to our. Uh, democracy uh, as well. Then on the competition um, side of things with the Digital Markets Act, which is really about uh, uh, the very, very biggest online platform, the largest online platforms that fulfill these thresholds. Uh, and, and, um, and we are talking here about a handful or perhaps two handfuls. We'll see what the final results is when the co-legislators are ready with their uh, uh, final uh, compromise, um, but um, but also here, of course, there are important uh, provisions uh, with regard to to unfair uh, practices when it comes to to data, the use uh, that the platform uh, platforms today make of the data uh, generated by third parties selling or providing uh, services on the platforms, and ultimately us as consumers through this third. Uh, parties, uh, but this competitiveness 
aspect as well is of course very uh, important. Uh, and I think this importance, the, the, the access to data, uh, what it means also for uh, democracy uh, and fairness, uh, I think it, it complements uh, this data, this Digital Services Act package very much, uh, the initiatives that we have seen uh, also to build um, a single market uh, for data uh, in the EEA. So I think with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Tron. It's uh, very convenient to have such a, a data analyst uh, in in house in after house. Uh, so thank you. Uh, maybe uh, before you leave, uh, you could also stick around for the next presentation if there might be more questions in the chat. Sometimes they come a little bit afterwards. Uh, you mentioned uh, a bit the European data space or the spaces. Uh, maybe you said it. In, well, you talked about the sectors. So the but the typical uses, uh, who would be the users? Is it only sectoral uh, experts or how, how do you explain the uses of, of the data spaces? Yes, when it comes to the access uh, rights, of course, and this is a key uh, question. And, and here as well, my understanding is that uh, this will very much be driven uh, by the stakeholders involved uh, in these discussions uh, as well, defining how the data uh, should may be made available. Uh, on what formats and, and with what access rights, of course, it's a, it's a key question. But having said that, uh, it's also, I think, very important to remember that this is not supposed to be uh, creating new silos uh, in a way that we again put the data uh, into sector specific uh, data spaces. Um, there's a lot of focus, of course, in developing standards, making sure that the data can also flow uh, between uh, these 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 sectors. Uh, if not, uh, uh, it would be very contra contradictory to the whole uh, the free flow of data uh, principle. Thank you, Trond. Again, um, so now we go back to the uh, EFTA statistical office in Luxembourg, straight from the EFTA house in Brussels. Uh, so that's uh, sort of our last stop uh, in this. Uh, Merry go round that we had here today. Uh, it's been a great conference, but it's not over. Uh, our deputy head of the EFTA statistical office, Marius Andersen, he will uh, have the last presentation. It's about the role of NSIs in a new EEA data framework. So, Marius, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just uh, wanted to check very quickly is my slides uh, visible? For you. Yeah, the slides are visible. I don't see uh, your image, but it may be my own screen. I'm not sure, but at least uh, the slides are visible. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the most important thing, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, for the moment, yes, but yeah. we would like to have you on, on, on uh, screen as well when, when you're done, but you can yeah. start. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. Um, uh, and uh, well, um, just to introduce myself as well, uh, my name is Marius Anderson. I am the deputy head of the EFTA statistical office, and um, uh, well, I have the honor of uh, having the last uh, presentation today about the role of the NSIs in in the new uh, EEA data framework. But as you said uh, earlier today, in many uh, great presentations. Um, so I will try not to overlap too much, but uh, in a way it's also difficult. But this is what I want to uh, cover uh, in, in this presentation today. Uh, I would first look uh, a bit on the roles and the functions of a data steward. Uh, then I will look more or less at the same uh, legal initiatives that Trun just presented. Uh, but maybe focusing uh, on a few um, uh, more specific uh, or specificities in this uh, legal initiatives, which um, concerns uh, either the N National Statistical Institutes or um, official statistics in one way. Uh, so that's the last point uh, to look at the possible implications for the National Statistical Institutes. Um, 
So um, there are many definitions of, of uh, data steward, and uh, I I don't want to dare to give uh, my uh, definition of this, but rather I would outline some typical uh, and possible functions that can be included in a data steward role. So uh, very often the data steward uh, provides support for data collection and integration of new data sources. Uh, they also provide quality assessment and quality assurance of uh, data. And uh, a typical task here would be that the data steward provide guidelines and prescribe quality standards for certain data. And for NSIs, they can often have this role uh, uh, as regards the quality of uh, or quality guidelines for statistical data, either in the national statistical system or sometimes even in a broader context. And uh, in addition and related to this is also to uh, provide um, uh, basic data standards and guidance in applying uh, type of data standards and data classifications. And the same holds for um, ensuring that uh, data is available to certain technical formats and, and that they comply with interoperability standards. Another point um, which we get back to when it comes to these legal initiatives is also uh, that the data steward often sets the guiding principles and rules for preserving the privacy of the data and confidentiality. In addition, the uh, data um, science I don't know. I, I'm not sure. There might be a problem with my camera here, but I hope uh, you all can hear me. Um, yes, we can hear yeah. you. We can hear you and we can see your slides. So just uh, fine yeah. at the moment. Good, good. good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I mean, uh, I was on the uh, the data steward functions and um, yeah. Uh, Data stewards often also provide uh, data science support or methodological support when it comes to the processing uh, of data. And more on the output side, um, data stewards often provide um, like certain standards for accessibility uh, or visualization of the data and often provide also open algorithms or source code together with the uh, data that can be directly applied to the published data. So I would also like to add that these are not new tasks for the National Statistical Institutes. Most NSIs, they have probably been responsible for many of these uh, functions before and provide their expertise to other parts of the national statistical system and the public sector. However, these functions are probably likely to take a broader scope when you consider data stewardship uh, in a broader context, uh, such as the public sector. And then, uh, in addition to the functions, it could also be useful to look at kind of the range or the scope of, of being uh, or fulfilling the role as a data steward. So here I have outlined three possible uh, roles. Mm -hmm. One is what I called a bit limited role. Here, the data steward does not uh, act as an implementing authority, but rather acts as a kind of competence center on data and provides guidance or advice on uh, certain data standards. And then the intermediary role. Here, the data steward shares the responsibility for data steward functions with other entities. Uh, in the public sector, the data steward role would be covered by many different authorities, which together cover all the data steward uh, functions. And in a way, you can call this shared uh, data stewardship. And then finally, you have 
the full data steward role where the data steward covers several or most of the functions and act as the leading and coordinating authority on any matters uh, concerning data and data steward functions. Now, um, this is just uh, to uh, show the overview of the legal framework. I think we have seen that uh, several times before today. But just to say that I, I would focus on the three initiatives, legal initiatives uh, for open data directive, the Data Governance Act and the European Data Act, and to see where they link possibly with uh, functions of the NSI or um, the data steward role. First is the Open Data Directive and the High Value Data Sets. Uh, the um, Open Data Directive defines the six areas where national administrations should provide so called high value data sets. Uh, of course, statistics is one of these areas, um, but I think national statistical institutes. Uh, probably also has a stake in uh, geospatial data, uh, possibly also risk observation and environment data, and companies and ownership. And the main point with this high value data sets is that uh, data that are already available should be shared, but in a very standardized and open format, which enables easy exchange and use of public sector data. So for statistics, having a central part here, uh, it's of course uh, a very good thing to make statistical data available together with other uh, data. Uh, and it's clear that in this context, the NSI has a clear and well-defined role as a data provider. When we look uh, at the European Data Governance Act, the, um, the link to, to, to statistics and NSI is a bit, what to say, it's a bit more, uh, 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 yeah, you can speculate a bit in, in, in the role and, and what kind of responsibilities different actors could take because it's also not yet adopted legislations. Um, although the European Data Governance Act is uh, quite advanced. And for um, the purpose of this presentation, I would just say that European Data Governance Act creates uh, a framework for reuse of uh, certain types of public sector data uh, while respecting confidentiality and privacy of the data. So it basically aims to make more data uh, held by public sector authorities available to users and in a way complements other uh, legislation in this area. Um, it's important to note that, I mean, this could be done in, in, in a secure processing environment, controlled or provided by the public sector or accessed in physical premises. But the act does not really create obligations on public sector bodies to uh, allow reuse. Uh, or to deviate from already existing confidentiality obligations. And then we have the data intermediation services. Um, overall, I would say that this aims to create uh, more trust in, in the intermediation role and the type of services, and also setting conditions for providing these services. Um, finally, we have what uh, is called the um, voluntary data sharing between individuals and enterprises who wish to share uh, data voluntarily and organizations that would like to make use of such data. And a typical example here is would be uh, research institutions. Um, for the uh, National Statistical Institutes uh, or uh, um, production of official statistics, um, I mean, first of all, this whole framework requires 
the organization of data governance in the national administration. For enabling reuse of data, a secure processing environment uh, uh, required, uh, is required and also ensuring standard techniques of preserving privacy and anonymizing data. I think the NSIs with a competence on data sharing and assuring privacy and confidentiality could be a partner in this works in this work in the national administration. The last two points here I included with question marks. Um, uh, the first one is about the intermediation services. Uh, the way I understand it, this is mainly for uh, private actors, um, at the same time, it resembles some uh, functions of what the data steward uh, um, would cover in its responsibility. Um, and about voluntary data sharing, uh, I also ask if there is a potential for official statistics based on this type of data. Uh, research institutions are mentioned as a typical example, but um, also in the introduction, in the introductory text of the legislative proposal of the Governance Act, the establishment of official statistics is also mentioned as a possible purpose for voluntary data sharing. And finally, the European Data Act, um, which is um, uh, very much more in the making, and the, the data spaces, um, it's uh, likely to further specify the general framework for data sharing, including one um, uh, type of business to government data, um, uh, which is a strategic objective for um, uh, official statistics. Uh, I mean, uh, accessing data shared by enterprises has been a strategic objective for um, official statistics uh, for quite some time, and I'm talking about then uh, data that go beyond the scope of traditional uh, data for statistics. Um, but uh, I also asked the question: um, Is it possible to use this statistic, uh, this um, uh, data provided through the uh, the European data spaces uh, for official statistics. Uh, I mean, for once, uh, well, we heard about sector legislation and probably also sector stakeholders that would participate in defining the use of such spaces. Um, I think, well, first the access to data for the purpose of producing official statistics uh, and how that would work would be would need to be defined. And in addition, the type of access and whether the data itself will be suitable to integrate in statistics is another part that needs to be defined. And finally, I think also the MSIs uh, or producers of official statistics need to define how the data possibly could be used. Um, an example, would you can would the data be suitable uh, to supplement existing uh, statistical indicators? Would it be suitable to integrate it directly into statistical production? So there are many things that remains to be uh, clarified. Um, well, with this slide, I kind of uh, would like to summarize the possible impact for uh, statistical institutes. Um, I mean, for the Open Data Directive uh, with the Implementing Act on high value data sets, the NSI will have a clear role as a data provider. For the Data Governance Act, I see the National Statistical Institutes uh, as a potential partner in organizing data governance in the national administration. And uh, where they could actively provide a role in providing expertise on data, data sharing, and setting up steward functions. Finally, European Data Act. I mean, here we are talking about the potential use of, of, of business to government data. Um, it has the potential to integrate uh, new sources in official statistics 
but this requires further specification of the type of data and also the access itself uh, remains to be de de determined and specified. So with that, I would uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you for the attention. I'm happy to take questions or comments. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Marius. Actually, uh, we <laughs> we still don't see your uh, camera, so if if uh, you can find out what what um, if, if your camera works. Uh, but we, we did see your presentation, which was, of course, uh, very good. Uh, but meanwhile, I, I, I would like to see if, if uh, because I see as, uh, several of, of the speakers earlier today uh, are still uh, with us. So if any of you would like to make any final comments now, that's of course uh, welcome. Uh, just uh, you can ask for it in the chat or simply uh, open your mic and, and, and camera and, and, and ask for the word. But, uh, but it's not an obligation, of course. Uh, it's been a long day. It's been here since nine o'clock this morning. Uh, we've gone across Europe to uh, uh, get a lot of uh, very good information on, on uh, uh, sources and, and, and uh, information on a on, on, uh, range of uh, topics. So uh, I think for myself uh, in the after house and uh, my team here with me, uh, thanks to all of, 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 of you, Georg especially, who's been and, and then the ASO after statistical office, two of your team members have been here with us as well this afternoon. Uh, ex excellent work. Uh, and, and with that, I, I throw the ball uh, back to you, Volker, in Luxembourg. Thank you very much, Torfinor. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to take also the occasion to, well, at the end of our conference, to thank also everybody. It has been really uh, a lot of work. It was not always evident because we had to turn everything from, uh, well, uh, an event that was planned as a hybrid one, as I mentioned already, into an online thing. So it was actually also going um, together with quite a lot of, um, let's say, mixed feelings. But in the end, I was very happy how it was running here. So first of all, I would like to thank all the presenters for, again, being flexible, excellent presentations. Thank you very much to all of you. Then I would like to thank, of course, uh, Tofinor for moderating the whole session and his team, Georg also. Thanks to Elena and thanks to Ambre, who helped you also there in uh, uh, Brussels. Uh, Alexander, Alexi, and here, of course, our team, I should definitely not forget to mention Braille, Braille uh, Olsen, who really did uh, a great job here in uh, organizing, helping organizing the whole event. And last but not least, of course, many thanks also to uh, the deputy, uh, Marius Andersen, uh, well, thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, to I should not forget also Pascal uh, here, our short-term expert who helped also. So uh, with this, I hope that I didn't forget anybody to thank anybody here. Uh, thanks also to all my colleagues from EFTA. They have been also very supportive in that uh, senior management as well as uh, the officers in, in Brussels. So with this, uh, once more, I wish you all uh, already ahead a Merry Christmas and uh, stay healthy. It was a pleasure to have this event with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much.